Hi, this is Garen Daly from Boston Sci-Fi. Uh, we're ge gearing up for our 47th annual Boston Science Fiction Film Festival and Marathon. Um, and over the course of the last several weeks, we've been doing these little bit of video casts about what's playing and maybe looking inside how we plan things. Uh, one of the things that we try to do is to try and balance out new film, old film, and show the breadth of science fiction films. Uh, you know, we do the marathon. The marathon has a lot of great old films in it. So it has some new films in it. The festival itself is usually mostly new films with an occasional revival or something that we're doing. But uh, Ian Judge, who is our, our uh, classic curator, came up with an idea that really kind of resonated for this year. Uh, and I think it might be a, a kind of a reaction to COVID. But the idea is to do a classic double feature. You know, to do the, to do, I don't know about you, but I remember coming to Boston when I was a young man and watching the classic creature feature on Channel 56. Uh, I remember going to the movies when I was a kid and catching a classic double feature or a, fa a, a feature in the movie theater. And I think we all remember that. So we, we put together a nice double feature. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but you know, where did double features come from and what was their purpose? And I thought I'd talk a little bit about that so you kind of understand it. And believe it or not, double features actually started in opera. And back in the day when there were, the, you know, none of those long ring cycle operas, but there were a lot of shorter operas that were being made. And, you know, operasarios and producers would put a couple of them together to create a longer experience for the, uh, the, the audience going to see the operas. When movies came around, especially in the 30s, when the economic depression really hit, the studios and the exhibitors and the distributors were all integrated together. And as a result, they wanted to get some of their good films and some of their bad films and put it together to create a bigger package to draw more people into the movie theaters. And they created double features. That's what it was in the 30s and partially into the 40s. And traditionally, these double features would include a newsreel, a cartoon, um, maybe a short subject, something along the line just to really pad it out. Now, one of the advantages of having a double feature when you're an exhibitor is the intermission time. The space between one film and the next film, you kept a little bit long so that you could get sell more popcorn. Because in the 30s, they started realizing that it was concession stands that made a lot of money. And the markup was, as we all know, enormous. So the profit lines were pretty good. In the 50s, things started changing with the 1948 Paramount Consent Decree. And the block booking of you play my dogs, you play my gems. In other words, a distributor would say, you want my really good film for Christmas? Well, you're going to have to play some of my old films, too. Uh, or you're going to have to uh, round out your schedule with, with other films. And that's where, the, that's where it would come in, into being, where they would play a really good film with a probably an older film that they're trying to get a little bit more money out of. Traditionally, the, the economic deal that an exhibitor would pay to a distributor would be that the one film that was the big film would get the majority of the money. And the lesser film, the B film, was a flat rate. That was usually like anywhere from $50 to $150 and you could, you know, you could do whatever you want with, with it, but the big money was made on the other one. And in the 60s, all this stuff just kept changing and, and, and evolving as it went into drive-ins and then later on into, uh, you know, theaters as well, to the point where it became a staple on TV, which is where the WB uh, Channel 56 Creature Feature started. That's just a really brief history of the double feature. And it's continuing today where we like double features. and. Like I said, on, on the, uh, the 19th, uh, Saturday at 11 a.m., we start a double feature of two great films, Jason and the Argonauts and Day the Earth Stood Still. Now, why these films were chosen, there are a number of different reasons. But there is one reason that we want to talk about, and that is one of our lead motifs for SF-47 is music. And both of these films have Bernard Herrmann music. And if you don't know who Bernard Herrmann is, Get, get on your Wikipedia and, and, and discover one of the great film composers of all time. Hitchcock used him. Everyone used him. But in these two films, his scores are also in there. Now, Jason and the Argonauts came out in 1963. And, you know, it, we were showing this film in 35 millimeter. 
So that's really cool. And it's going to look really sharp because it's Technicolor. The film was produced by Ray Harryhausen. And here's the trailer for that film. story of an epic voyage that has been told and retold since the birth of Western civilization, now presented on the screen for the first time. Ah! Ah! Do your heart crack and your back break? Jason and his band of Argonauts, the mightiest warriors the world of adventure has ever known, in search of the fabulous magic golden fleece. Where will you find this miracle? I have heard there is a tree at the end of the world with a fleece of gold hanging in its branches. Here is the magnificent excitement of that legendary time when men like gods and gods like men lived and loved violently. Todd Armstrong and Nancy Kovac portray the classic lovers. Jason, the man who challenges the gods. Medea, who betrays a kingdom for love. Acastus, driven by a lust for power. Hera, goddess and woman, who defies the might of Zeus, king of the gods, who unleashes his fury at rebellious mortals. The Argonauts, caught in the clutches of the towering bronze giant Talos. The Argonauts, battling vultures harpies. Jason, threatened by the seven-headed Hydra. Medea, the temple dancer, mysterious, exciting, and exotic. Jason, battling the army of skeletons. Kill, kill, kill them all! One man defying a universe of mortal and immortal danger. Jason and the Argonauts, a search that became a legend. You know, anyone who knows me knows I love trailers and, you know, I, that's a good one. It really is. When you look at how, when it was made, the, uh, the colors that are jumping off the screen uh, and even, uh, you know, the, the style of, of, the, of the trailer. You, when you look at trailers over a course of the period, you can see what, a trailer from the 30s, a trailer from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, and, all, and so on. They're all different because our tastes have, ch have changed. But that's a really particularly good trailer. Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, came out, and it was also, I mean, Charles Schneer was the producer, but the other money behind it was Ray Harryhausen. The two of them worked together for a lot of film, for a lot of films. This is one of their films. And there is a, a good body of knowledge or a good uh, consideration that this was Ray Harryhausen's best film for special effects. Unfortunately, the film did not make enough money for, for the uh, planned sequel to be made. And that's kind of a shame. And I think uh, it kind of colored some of uh, Ray Harryhausen's work afterwards. Um, a little bit about the uh, the actors. Todd Armstrong, who plays Jason, uh, ended up having a tragic ending, ending where he ended up committing suicide by shotgun. Um, and there was a couple of theories going on around that. He did that when he was 55. Uh, one theory was is that he had contracted AIDS and was going to die. Another one was is that he had gotten addicted to some sort of opiate or, or dope because of a back injury that he sustained in a film, but eventually he did kill himself. Uh, Nancy Kovac, uh, Novak uh, ended up having a pretty good career um, and was on actually on Star Trek. She did a lot of TV shows. She was up for an Emmy for a one shot. 
on uh, Mannix, that old TV detective show, and ended up ma marrying uh, Zubin Menta, the maestro uh, musician. Um, but it's still a fun film. And when we look at it, you know, today we sometimes think, that, well, the special effects aren't that good. They're not as good as the CGI in, in a Marvel Comics universe thing, but still they're really, really good. And the one thing that Ray Harryhausen was able to put into his characters and into his, 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 his stop motion animation is a sense of personality. But here, here's a little fact for you. The, it took him four months to record the skeleton battle scene and it played for three minutes on screen. That much work for that little time. But still, I, I can't wait to see it on, that, on the big screen in 35 millimeter. Uh, it's going to be a hoot. Now, the other film that we have in the double feature is The Day the Earth Stood Still from 1951, a classic film that we used at Boston Sci-Fi as one of our original graphics uh, way back at SF1, 2, and 3. Um, and again, this is 1951. Uh, Robert Wise is directing it. Uh, and I, I think we've all seen this film several times. Michael Rennie was in it. Patricia Neal was in it. Hugh Marlowe was in it. Sam Jaffe. I always love anything with Sam Jaffe. In it. But let's take a look at a trailer and see, and just when we're talking about trailers, this is a trailer made 12 years earlier than the one that we just saw. We interrupt this program to give you a bulletin just received from one of our naval units at sea. A large object traveling at supersonic speed is headed over the North Atlantic toward the east coast of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Drew Pearson. We bring you this special radio television broadcast in order to give you the very latest information on an amazing phenomenon. The arrival of a space ship in Washington. The Army has taken every precaution to meet any emergency which may develop. Just a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, I think something is happening. to give you these facts but if you threaten to extend your violence this earth of yours will be reduced to a burned out cinder but he's a robot without you what could he do there's no limit to what he could do he could destroy the earth all vehicles close in. Let's go. just saw the inside of the uh, spaceship there. And if I remember my trivia correctly, and I'll have to check myself because I'm not sure, exactly sure about this, but Buck, Buckminster Fuller helped design the interior uh, of that. And there's a lot of great, interesting trivia facts about Day the Earth Stood Still. For instance, um, Spencer Tracy was offered the, ro the, ro the uh, role of Klaatu and turned it down because he didn't want to play second fiddle to a robot. And then Claude Rains was also uh, offered the job of uh, Cloud too, but he had a previous commitment with a with a uh, play, um, and you kind of wonder, well, what, what would it have been like with either one of those two playing it? Michael Rennie, Rennie seems to be just just perfect for it. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but there was actually a sequel being planned, and th this is kind of interesting about both of the uh, films that we're showing for this double feature is that it was never made, but Ray Bradbury had been actually hired to write the script for it. And it was never made because it didn't make a lot of money. And there were issues of censorship with this film. Because again, remember, this is 1951. 
and the House of Un-American Activities was very active and really putting a lot of pressure on it. So two pieces of little censorship that occurred in the film. One is that the army would not deal, touch it with a 10-foot pole. They just thought that it was, you know, communistic and, and all that other kind of stuff, and it's Hollywood and stuff like that. So they couldn't get the army to help, but they did get the National Guard to help, and that's where all those people came in. And I always wondered why they didn't have more tanks and stuff like that, but I think that's because it was the National Guard. The other bit of censorship has to do with the 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 one of the final lines, and that final line is, that power is reserved for the Almighty Spirit. And they were referring to the power that Gord had and that he could destroy worlds and things of that nature. And they felt that that was way too uh, communistic and socialistic and un-American. So they had forced the filmmakers to insert that line in there. Um, and one la last little bit of, of trivia, you know, Klaatu Barada nicked up, been in tons of films, we all know it. Uh, and according to Edmund North, who was the, uh, screenwriter, he kind of made that up. It kind of sounded good and it kind of sounded cool, and that's why he did it. But the reason that we are doing this double feature is because it's going to be a ton of fun. I love double features. I started my bit when I started working in this business, that's all I did. I booked double features uh, over at uh, the Coolidge Corner and over at uh, the Somerville Theater way back when. Um, and it, it's uh. It's, they're fun. And I know Ian, Ian Judge, our curator of classic films and also the general manager over at the Somerville Theater is going to have some surprises for us because I wouldn't be surprised. And I don't know this yet. If we have a cartoon, if we have a newsreel, he might even have corn dogs, but I don't think so. Anyways, uh, thank you for joining us. Again, the date is February 19th at 11 o'clock in the morning at the Somerville Theater in the big house. And Jason and the Argonauts will be in 35 millimeter. So thank you very much. My name is Garen Daly, and we'll see you at the film festival coming up and starting on February 16th. Find out more at bostonsci-fi.com.